Hi guys. So this was my first dialogue with Mina Salami. She's the author of Sensuous Knowledge and one of Elle magazine's 12 Women Changing the World. She is actually the first feminist thinker that really has clicked for me and the first one that I've engaged with uh, through Sense Space. But her work um, really resonated with me and there's a lot of deep and interesting explorations of power and beauty and um, the way in which patterns in nature can inform our thinking which has been a big topic for me so i hope you guys enjoy the conversation hi mina hi jacob Welcome to Sense Space. Thank you so much. I'm really pleased to be here. Yeah, uh, you are the author of this wonderful book, and I really enjoy getting to hold up the book because it feels more like a TV interview or something. But <laughs> it's a beautiful book, sensuous knowledge, and it felt like it was really sort of dovetailing in so many ways with Sense Space and my own kind of. Um, you know, philosophical life inquiry. Um, and also you're going to be the first um, female conversation partner on Sense Space after quite a few episodes. So I'm glad that it's you. And um, yeah, just pleased to be kicking off. Yeah, I don't know where precisely to start because your book is so broad and you've kind of drawn in from so many avenues and I guess just begin by recognizing that it's this is not um, certainly not what I expect when I read the words you know black feminist approach um, I'm expecting something much more rigid I guess based on where I've been sort of sitting and looking out in the in the cultural landscape but this book is really multidimensional and it's weaving through your own life story and art and poetry and um, the history of liberation movements and all of this stuff. So congrats. <laughs> yeah. I mean, what was the process of, of getting to this point? Well, um, my life, I suppose, you know, um, it does feel like a, a kind of uh, a synthesis, a culmination of gathering of things that I've been exploring um, for a long time and, and the journey that, that I'm on um, in this lifetime. Um, I want to first say, you know, thank you very much for the kind um, feedback. And I'm really glad that you enjoyed the book. And, um, and yeah, it was, it was quite challenging putting it together because each chapter is looking at a specific topic even though they're interwoven but you know I am looking at power in one chapter and then beauty in another and identity and blackness and womanhood and, and each one of those chapters felt like it could be a separate book um, and, mm -hmm. and it was very very difficult to pull myself away from whichever chapter I was working on um, I, I found myself really like grounding my roots into whichever topic um, was was being worked on at the time. So I'll definitely go with a bit of an maybe an easier <laughs> uh, option with my my next book. Um, I'd also just want to address that um, you know this the expectation of black feminism um, that that you mentioned that you'd had um, and that you were thinking it might be something more rigid. And because I think that's quite an interesting um, assumption and place. And, uh, you know, I, I guess I sense a part of me becomes defensive when I hear that because mm. black feminism for me is the opposite of that. It's almost, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a place that opens and expands and allows me to exist. Well, at the same time, uh, you know, I understand where you would be coming from uh, to an extent without knowing 
everything about you, but you know how, uh, because of the, 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 the nature of contemporary conversations and the culture wars and the divisions, um, it's, yeah, I, I can see how for somebody who maybe hasn't engaged with black feminisms of the past, um, what you're getting in so many online spaces today could seem as, uh, yeah, something antagonistic, uh, you could say. Um, but I, yeah, I do feel it's important just to, to, to bring that to the fore that, you know, for example, I've been, I've been working um, with black feminism for uh, over a decade, like explicitly doing lectures and writing about it. Uh, and when I started off, you know, there was no discussion about black feminism in, in public discourse. Uh, you know, it was really, really a minim minimum amount of attention paid to that. Uh, and it's been so interesting to observe because, uh, you know, when it then changed about five years ago or so, um, you know, the, the reaction that I would get when I, even though my work was basically the same, uh, the reaction changed almost overnight. Um, it felt like that for me in terms of how people responded. Um, in, in the first five years or so of my writing my blog and doing my work, um, I think people would feel like, oh, I don't know much about that. And, um, you know, what does it mean for you and, and so on. And then in the last five years, it's the opposite. I feel like people box me immediately when I say that I'm a black feminist and, and assume that I'm somebody who's, you know, um, canceling people on Twitter or something like that. I don't know. Um, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, um, and so part of that actually really feeds into the, the process of writing the book for me, I guess, because um, on the one hand, I'm, I, I'm like, it's in some ways, centrist knowledge is, is a love letter to some elements of black feminism as they have edified me and been a part of my life. Um, but I'm simultaneously aware of uh, the kind of divisions and tensions that exist um, in in broader conversations, and I'm also wanting to bring the many insights, not just of Black feminism, but of of myself as somebody who um, has access to multiple perspectives because of my many um, ethnic backgrounds. I'm multilingual. I'm from an interfaith family, um, and yeah, just wanting to, to share that kind of uh, multi-perspectival worldview with, with a broader audience. Yeah, absolutely. And as you're articulating that, it kind of begins to make more sense to me that, you know, I was at university from like 2014, um, well, until last year, basically. So the period of time in which I was studying was one in which you kind of had the the campus um, spirit of the United States was already coming over. Um, but I always have found myself having the best friendships with people of like really mixed backgrounds, like all through my life. And um, I've had a lot, you know, although I've not really spoken to feminists or my encounters with feminists have felt like it was quite sort of ideologically constrained or reactive. Um, I've had a lot of women in my life who were like, you know, real kind of philosophical teachers, um, people who I was in relationship with and so forth. Um, and one of the things, you know, very often these girls, these women were um, critical of contemporary feminism, but had a real sense for um, the lacking of the feminine um, and really kind of had to beat my head against the wall to get to the point of being able to understand what that was. And it was all tied up with, you know, I didn't read fiction, I only read nonfiction. I was very disembodied, kind of atheist rationalist approach. Um, but being in these relationships with people who had a real relationship to the feminine really opened up all these um, arts and understanding of fiction and 
at a kind of philosophical metaphysical level just getting a lot more nuance and getting sort of in between um sort of linearly defined points of um understanding so what i see in this in this work sensuous knowledge is like a sort of more kind of call for a way of being than um a prescription of of action that people can sign up to and identify with and um yeah it, it feels to me really congruent just with the path that i've been on of like getting more intuitive broadening the sort of dimensions of thinking and understanding you know and that's I think we're still really in a minority, um, in a minority position in holding that view um, in the halls of power, but also in you know the journalistic classes, the academic sphere, the idea that this kind of embodied stuff that goes on in the rest of your life is integrally related to your thought um, structures is just not present. So maybe you could riff on that a little bit and we could talk maybe about the kind of the depth of fragmentation um, in thinking. Yeah, um, there's a lot there. My mind is racing from like, I wanted to respond to many, many threads that you went on there. Um, I'll, I'll, yeah, let me see where I should start. I, I mean, for one, I think that, um, you know, what is so interesting about these contradicting times um, that we're in, and maybe all times are, are contradicting, but um, what is really fascinating is how like fragments or fringes, small percentages of groups within bigger groups are arriving at very similar positions. Um, and so, you know, within like the feminist space, as well as within uh, even within like, you know, certain sciences in, in, in physics, you would have, you know, that, that group of quantum theorists or something that are like seeing how uh, there's, a, there's something that they might describe as a spiritual connection um, between atoms and, you know, nature and everything having that kind of connection. And then you have um, like even in the men's rights space, um, <laughs> there's a... a I guess even populism in itself is like some kind of reaching out for uh, a more emotional connection to, to how to be and uh, how to operate in this world as a whatever, you know, insert whatever. Um, but it's, yeah, so that, that for me is really quite interesting because I think that, you know, it is really important that at, at, at some point in this century, um, if, if we're not going to see the collapse of not only the environment, but also of, of humanity in a sense, you know, of, of society, of, of, of a kind of glue that connects societies together, we're going to have to, to transcend the very divisive elements of these conversations. Um, and maybe part of that is where the, the, the feminine um, comes in. And I mean, it's a bit, it can be a bit tricky to, to convey this sense of what you embody um, as a woman. Uh, I think that for many women, you come to a place where you're, you recognize that there is a patriarchal order that um, limits your life, if not like outright can destroy your life and everything that you're seeking to, to do is impeded by the traditions, the history, the institution, the customs, you know, the, the, the personal and the political, really. Um, and then there's sort of two big cultural narratives um, that I would say, that I would um, tease out that women have access to. And I'm saying women, but this can apply to men in a world where men are becoming increasingly conscious about feminism and femininity and uh, kind of gender relations that aren't working and seeing that the notions of masculinity and patriarchy are part of that problem. So even when I say women, this, I, I could say men as well to some extent. But when a woman comes to that kind of bifurcation in her life of 
uh, of sensing hierarchy is impeding on her choices, I think the two main cultural narratives that are available to her are feminism on the one hand, and then there's something that we could call, um, what should we call it, like a feminine awakening, the conscious feminine or something like that, um, you know, embodied femininity. There's, there's very many names for that and they're quite, they're quite current. Like there's, there's a lot of conversation about them at the moment. Um, and so she either might go like directly toward feminism or toward, let's just call it the conscious feminine. Um, or, and this is, I think, what is more likely to happen, that there's a sense of, uh, of, of using both um, to, to, as, as sense-making tools um, for how she can like, transcend and move beyond the patriarchal limitations. The problem um, becomes that there is a tension between these two. And I think that that tension between these two is almost what we can also apply more widely to tensions between, you know, the uh, rational thinking and science and, um, you know, there's, there's, uh, uh, it just, yeah, because when one, feminism can seem to be too, too rigid, um, too uh, focused on structures, on politics, um, trying to be, like, it, it can feel very boring almost to a woman who stands at this crossroads in her life. It can feel too academic, too sort of, you know, imposing. Um, whereas to another type of woman, the conscious feminine can seem too um, unserious, uh, like too spiritual, too essentialist, certainly. That's one thing that would come up. Um, and so, yeah, there's a really complex relationship between these two major cultural narratives. Um, and you could say that what I am doing in sensuous knowledge, among many other things that I'm doing, is, is exploring the relationship between these two a little bit, um, between feminism and the conscious feminine. Um, and because I believe that they overlap in really significant ways, um, number one, they are both really strongly opposed to patriarchy. So in kind of uh, feminine conscious feminine spaces, embodied feminine, you know, there's all these uh, like rituals um, and things that can be even quite like, they, they sort of center female anatomy. So you have like yoni, um, yoni is the, I believe the Sanskrit word for vagina. Mm -hmm. And so you have like these yoni workshops and, you know, things like that, which, which are really, I mean, that's, that's anti-patriarchal. Um, and then you have, uh, um, you know, obviously feminism is an explicit movement against patriarchy. So, so the two are like really about the same thing at the end of the day. Um, but this, this tension is what fascinates me. And, um, and, I, and I think that, you know, because at the point that a woman is, is, is approaching these things, that tension creates a fragmentation in the mind. And remember again that I'm saying woman, but I, I could, it could also be a man. Um, in fact, it, it is absolutely something that affects men as well, because you know you, you're in the process of becoming what culture deems to be a man. There's such a, a rejection and vilification of the feminine, um, and so yeah, like in in that tension, in in those divides, what that creates then is a fragmentation in the mind of the person. And once that occurs, uh, you know, it just becomes really difficult to be able to, to see the world coherently, holistically, um, to make connections between what you're experiencing um, and the very tools that you feel can help you experience whatever you're experiencing better. Um, and so this is, uh, sensuous knowledge is, is a synthesis of these many different ideas so that you know if we approach knowledge in that kind of holistic sensuous sense then whatever we are experiencing individually or collectively politically or personally um, we're able to to like 
approach it wholly so that we don't create fragmentation within, um, which leads to kind of collective neurosis and um, paranoia and things like that. So yeah, so that's that's the kind of small aim that the book is is trying to facilitate. Wow, yeah, and it feels also that that's kind of would I be correct to say that this is kind of your your own journey that you're pulling together it's like the tension that was worked out within you that has kind of arrived at the synthesis in this book um yes of course in 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 many ways uh, that's actually a really wonderful question because i haven't thought about that even though that's what the book is advocating um because it feels to me more that that is how i view the like in my life in my worldview and in, in my embodiment of Mina Salami, um, I, it feels that, that I have a relative ease of bringing these two together in a way that I, I feel like so many people around me or society, the societal narrative doesn't. Um, you know, I am a feminist um, without question, but I'm also, uh, you know, I, I'm also a spiritual person. Um, and for me, the, that doesn't pose, like if I, when I'm just in my own space and, you know, with my circles, um, living my life in, in the way that I intend, reading literature, whatever I'm doing, my, my food consumption, my, my meditation, my exercise, like it is, there is a, a constant um, tandem between these two worlds and many other worlds in a way that doesn't feel to be in conflict. Um, and yeah, um, so I guess I, it's almost like, I would say that I, I feel like my gift to the world, my talent, my, my offering, is that I'm able to combine a kind of a politics and a spirituality, um, for one of a different word, um, both in, in theory and in practice. And, 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 and I see why that is, because I've been able to do that, I can see why there is a struggle um, where that kind of division and tension occurs in our lives. Um, but that said, absolutely, um, I'm, I'm, you know, there's also, there, would, there are certainly parts of my life and in my thinking, there are moments when I encounter that, that, um, that tension. And, and I find that that is really where a lot of my exploration then can be fruitful. Because you know, when I'm questioning, um, as as I said when we first connected, um, this this sense of like when things are happening, when you have an idea and then everything about that idea starts to manifest in your life. You know, you you encounter a new book that's about that idea. You meet mm. people who are working in that field, um, and it feels like oh, this is there's something divine about these encounters it's almost you know magical um but then my rational brain goes oh come on um you know it's just because you're thinking about this now that that these things are showing up that's an example of of that tension um happening in my life and where it happens with between feminism and the conscious feminine uh perhaps more than anywhere else is like in in this concept of essentialism. Um, I think that that's quite a, I think that that presents a real obstacle for many people to, in terms of like bridging the two, because there's very clearly something essentialist in, within the kind of conscious feminine awakening realm. Um, you know, there are ideas of, I think as you alluded to, um, as you know, the feminine is something uh, to do with imagination and creativity. Like you mentioned, you were reading more fiction when you were exposed to that energy. Um, there's, a, there's, you know, notions of the feminine as being more soft and tender and poetic and things like that. Um, and yet, you know, in, in, when, when any of those kinds of sentiments are said declaratively in any way, then there is the risk that we're essentializing uh, what ultimately is a, 
at least an entangled, a definition of feminine that is entangled with patriarchy. Um, because, you know, a lot of those, those notions of the feminine come from uh, religious life and religious institutions have tended to be patriarchal. So, uh, you know, there is certainly uh, like a real question to grapple with there. And that's where feminism comes in uh, because feminism is almost, the way that I see it, it is almost like the, the intellectual uh, part of what ultimately would be like a very powerful representation of the feminine. Um, and it is able to, to answer and to grapple with those kinds of problems, uh, theoretically, philosophically. Um, and also, of course, I mean, feminism is also, of course, very much a, a grassroots activist kind of space. Um, but it is uh, almost predominantly, I see it as a, as, a, as a female intellectual tradition that is centuries long and has been sort of uh, really intellectually grappling with tensions um, in, in society, various kinds of tensions. Mm. <laughs> so much there. Um, just allow it to gather for a moment. I, so I really see you as a bridge builder. Um, and I've been talking to a lot of uh, thinkers who have this unique property. I don't know how familiar you are with kind of Zach Stein and, and the sort of game B um, conversation space. Um, there's a number of thinkers who are very kind of trans paradigmatic um who have a certain sort of spiritual or metaphysical depth to their thinking and so when they crop up in um, the sciences or in um, feminism or in kind of well really anywhere um, my sense is that there's a kind of cropping up of all of these individuals who are just breaking out of the existing structures of thought and then just pulling the sinews of everything that they're encountering in their life or their own personal um, inquiry together to create something really unique, which is actually a product of them shifting to a different way of existing in their lives, uh, you know, responding to what John Bavakey calls the meaning crisis, um, the meta crisis, all of the different characterizations seem to point to a phase shifting moment for humanity in which, as you say in the book, the, I think the ways of thinking uh, are what have to be addressed and understood rather than the content of what we think or which, which side we're on. Because there's this enormous trap that goes on within the, um, I mean, in the, in the game B space, it's referred to as game A. And I think game A sits in a similar kind of position to your use of Europatriarchal knowledge, which is kind of a self-terminating system based on consumption, which is going to exhaust itself um, and is rooted in a kind of rivalrous dynamic um, between states and between political parties and between individuals in the corporate world, um, but also between activist movements. And so, um, it feels as if there's something in this tension that you've kind of stood with one foot on each between feminism and the feminine, let's say, or conscious feminine and political feminism, which is like uh, the, the sort of materialist, rivalrous, 
um, the materialists a, were okay. The line went really poor, um, so I didn't hear. Oh, my connection has gone unstable. How on? Um, the last thing I heard was you saying that you know standing on with one foot in feminism and the conscious feminine. Sure. Yeah. So. So one seems to seems to whilst feminism sits in rejection of the patriarchy, it seems to me to kind of fall into the trap of embodying many of the characteristics of the society. Like it doesn't break out of the materialist um, understanding. It doesn't break out of the fragmentation necessarily, although it's able to do it in certain indices of intersectionality. Um, we could perhaps see it as still being confined within certain dimensions of thinking or ways of thinking, still being very intellectual or disembodied in certain ways, or to the extent that it is embodied, perhaps coming with still an element of reaction. Um, like it almost feels like an expression of the collective trauma of our like male, female relations, historical circumstance that we've arrived at. Um, and I do feel that there's a lot that we can understand about these sort of meta dynamics if we really hone in on the actual sort of relationships between men and women, like one to one in a in a in a marital unit or in a family. Um, just to sort of to to open it up. I mean, when I first was being exposed to what we can broadly call the feminine um, and you can switch that out for the intuitive or the the unknown having a relationship to the unknown or not knowing um, to the more expressive domains um, I realized that I was actually in a there were a lot of men that I knew who were actually the feminine um, the more feminine one in the relationship and the women were the more masculine one. But at the societal level, it was like, she's the feminine one, he's the masculine one, but actually he's the one with the, um, he's the one that's more emotional and more like intuitive, but maybe there's an instability there. And so then with the female, she's not afforded the possibility of getting in touch with her feminine side because she's having to play the masculine of um, being the emotional regulator and being in control of um, managing the emotional relationships around her. And so it's this weird like switch or like paradoxical switch that seems to sit right at the heart of the masculine feminine relationships in our society and that obviously that for me feels like the the depth of what was going on that i didn't hear from this kind of game a feminism um or really anybody like there's no political or ideological um cultural movements in our society that get down to that depth of um you know deep sort of trauma dynamics and all of this kind of thing so yeah and i'm really just drawing all of this in because it feels so congruent with with what you explored in your book and the relationships this kind of dialectical relationship and and you know if we were to again drawing out the local to the meta circumstance if we have to say um our society is fundamentally broken it's a little bit like if we're in a marriage and we say the marriage is fundamentally broken or something like that um 
if the relationship to the, the third entity in society is always one from opposition or one from wounding or one from alienation or fragmentation um, rather than a kind of loving integration, then I don't think we, we get where we need to go. Yeah, um, I mean, we certainly need to emphasize, uh, you know, love and integration, but a kind of critical integration. Um, you know, we're not, we don't think the same. Um, we shouldn't. We we are. We must create like spaces where there's room for disagreement and and different opinions and even. Um, you know, very, very playful and radical repositionings of masculinity and femininity. Um, and I, I, I guess I am concerned and I feel a little bit restless with how um, in the spaces uh, of, uh, I know a little bit about um, game B. I haven't sort of been exposed to it myself or been taken part in any of the conversations, but I have a broad overview of what it is. And um, and yeah, I, I would agree with you that the, the my definition of your patriarchal knowledge um, shares a kind of similar positioning to what I glean is meant by game A. Um, I guess I would extend it further and say that, you know, your patriarchal knowledge and where we're where it is leading us, there's like a, there's almost something um, necrophilic about it. You know, it's like where where there's there's an element of self hatred um, because it's you know it's almost like we need uh, we want machines to be better than us. We want uh, we want to constantly develop knowledge that it's almost as though it proves. Uh, that we are not sufficient in our uh, in our bodies and to the extent that we are an animal species as well as a species that can think rationally and so on um, there's a yeah just uh, there's there's so much self-loathing in that type of knowledge production that is uh, strictly formulaic and um, and sort of uh, dismisses anything that has to do with interiority and poetry and embodiment um and yeah i can't see it leading anywhere than to you know whatever the ultimate pinnacle of of self-loathing um collective self-loathing is but you know there's so much language to kind of sugarcoat that process and so uh you know we think that we're we're modernizing or um uh what else what are the, there's the, the language is sort of alluding to it being something positive um, when in fact it's a kind of self annihilating process. Um, but I, um, yeah, I guess I, I do um, take a, a distance from notions of, uh, yeah, like something like bringing uh, the, the, the idea of a family as consisting of masculine and feminine, um, because, you know, I think that, or not even just family, but anything, any kind of language that goes back to your patriarchal knowledge is something that I'm very wary and conscious about, because if we are in the process of paradigmatic, um, intellectual, conscientious transformation, and if we want to move toward higher dimensions of coexistence, which at this point, that is all we should be striving for. That's like what the survival of humanity depends on, is a, a higher dimension of coexistence. We're still going to have tensions and uh, issues and problems between genders. Um, certainly, like that's not gonna go away. It's always been there, but, but we, I think, everyone um, who thinks about these things can agree or can, can sense that there is a higher dimension way of tackling those tensions. Um, and, and I think the, yeah, that it cannot contain the old language. 
And so sometimes in, in the space um, of, I don't know much about Game B, as I said, but I guess it's, there's a parallel somewhat with like meta-modern thought um, and that kind of space. Um, I find that, you know, it's, a, it's actually a, a language, a, a space that is advocating feminism um you know it is it, it's and it's there's something uh, ironic and but more importantly there's something uh concerning there or limiting there because there's a uh there's such a, a body of literature of knowledge of wisdom that feminists have produced over centuries and i just want to say like feminism is um it isn't this sort of intellectual space only if contemporary feminism, yes, but but we have to be so mindful of you know when we talk about feminism, we're talking about uh, you know going back to um, the Susan B. Anthony's, the the Virginia Woolf, Simone de Beauvoir, uh, Winnie Mandela. Like there's so many, um, there's such a long history there. And in fact, I would kind of argue that the the space of the conscious feminine is a result of feminism. Because it was it was feminists who uh, who critiqued uh, patriarchal religions, and that led to this really strong, um, yeah, like a, a, a the whole like goddess movement, and and things like that are direct results of the feminist movement, and not vice versa. Um, and so and and th those are like we see I see so many elements of that tradition of like. The, the, that element of the feminist tradition, the goddess movements, the feminine, and things like that in, say, metamodern conversations. Um, you know, there's even like a lot of anti patriarchal um, conversations in that space, but, but there's no connections being made to the feminist tradition, which has, you know, articulated these things for so long. Um, and so, and that concerns me because I think that we, we might be creating yet a, a level of tension um, because it, it kind of alienates, uh, you know, if you're a group that has always been talking about uh, bringing more kindness and love and, you know, not exploiting the environment, um, changing gender relations so they can be more harmonious. You know, I mean, that is what feminism is about. Um, and if that's what you've been talking about for so long, and then in contemporary discourse, that starts to pop up everywhere, but nobody sort of draws it back, then that will create a new level of alienation. Uh, but it also, I guess it, it also just limits the, uh, yeah, the amount of, of wisdom that is available, um, you know, and, and I'm sure that there are, like similar processes happening also within feminism. In fact, I know that there are like there, you know, there's, there's also because we don't cross over, um, there isn't enough like sort of interdisciplinary consciousness because I'm not speaking just of like academia, but literally like with interdisciplinary wisdom. Um, I think that is like the, really the, the, the tool um, that will bring us to the higher dimension of coexistence, you know, it's uh, interdisciplinary wisdom. And yeah, uh, I think that's, that's, that's what I'm hoping uh, with sensuous knowledge to not only to like make a case for, but I think, you know, in just in is like show don't tell um, in a sense, because the book has been read by, by people of varying backgrounds and and of course, you know, people don't agree on everything and that's not the point, but just seeing that, yeah, like similar kind of thought is being produced in, in different groups is, is a useful thing, I think. Yeah, I mean, it was enormously, it's for me, like having been on the sort of intellectual and then maybe post intellectual and something a bit broader track for many years, it's a big event for me to be engaging with the feminist text um, and to find one that actually, you know, there was very little that I disagreed with 
that really struck up against me, but I also felt a certain wariness as I was going into the text, um, which was reflective of what we talked about before. Um, and I think some of it is revealed in the relationship to language. Um, like very often, you know, something like the expression, we live in a patriarchal society is just sort of recited. It's a little bit like Jesus died on the cross for our sins. Um, and it's not really about the, the meaningful content. The way that it's being expressed is not actually an invitation to an exploration at all. It's a kind of um, recitation. So I will park that. But as you were speaking about metamodernism, I really felt like it's, it's a tension that I've been exploring in a, in a piece that I'm trying to write right presently, um, which is there is this need to construct a more integral narrative, um, a multidisciplinary synthesis uh a lot of different people are working on this now it seems to be emerging uh, the integral and metamodern and what john bavake is doing and um and what you're doing in this book but then there's this dialectical tension with that which goes beyond narrative um which is why it's so important that you bring in so much of your own life and not just your own life, but lifeness. Um, you kind of pull the world into the book. And so, yeah, I think the sort of the red pill of sensuous knowledge is that it's kind of drawing you into the world. Um, and maybe it's attempting to draw you into your own life. Um, and for me, I mentioned when I reached out, but it was it was reading your piece on what is emerging um, about exuberance that really clicked for me in the right place at the right time. And I was just in recognition of, wow, I've encountered someone in a completely different paradigm who sort of stumbled into the same place. It felt like um, your relationship to nature and the way that you draw upon branching patterns in nature is something that I've been so, has been so meaningful to me in my life and such a like, a feeling that we have to like, in the, in the process of bringing more of life into the expression, like giving life and embodiment to the intellectual explorations. Um, we also have to pull in the metaphor and the language of that stuff. So pulling in these like nature metaphors, which you do so wonderfully in the book. Um, and also pulling in like the erotic and all of this stuff that's like sidelined and therefore kind of out of the consciousness in the way that we're speaking. Yeah, and we can, continue branching off from that, but it's just to really bring it home that like this recognition that you've come to about branching patterns um, was for me like really huge. Like when I was going through like a really sort of traumatic work depression period of my life and really just sort of getting opened up to the world at the same time um is when i found a lot of solace and wisdom available in these patterns and it's so strange when you walk through urban environments and you notice you notice the extent to which we don't actually see trees like we kind of have the concept of tree and then they're all sort of the same as we're walking through but then when you move into this um space of sensitivity which you know psychedelics or 
deep trauma work or spirituality or just luck, I guess, can bring you into, you really perceive the strangeness and mysteriousness and these sort of patterns in nature become like the richest metaphors available to you for understanding, you know, case in point, I was walking in a cemetery today, looking at trees, thinking about having this conversation with you. And I was look, I was observing this tree and I was thinking about how we in the urban environment can always see the um, branches of the tree but then we're kind of concrete around all of the roots. And to me, the roots and the underground has always been the kind of representation of the, the part of the self that's sort of grounded in darkness or grounded in like trauma, grounded in difficult experiences, but we don't reveal that. And so, incredibly insightful and would just love to to hear more from you about what sort of how how that's developed and what it means to you. Sure. Um, yeah, it's it's also interesting how like you know what you just said about what the roots represent to you and that they're hidden, um, but then roots are also you know their life. They're the source of the the tree's life. Um, and what sustains it uh, and it just made me think about the connection between between life and pain um, and you know something that that is so real for people individually but also collectively for us all um, and you know going back to what I was saying about a kind of uh, self-annihilating structure it's almost you know symbolically you could say that we're we're uh, concealing life, uh, the life source. Um, but yes, exusions um, is, uh, is it's a co reconceptualization of power, um, which, uh, you know, I, it came to me so intuitively. Um, I couldn't really, I wouldn't really be able to even pin down or describe, uh, you know, the moment that I thought of exusions or why I thought of exusions or how or anything like that. Um, I knew that I wanted to explore power in my book. Um, it was going to be a central theme as it has been a central theme in my life. Um, and I knew that I wanted to, uh, you know, because we often think about power as power over or power to or power with, uh, which are all very different things by the way. So power over is, in my view, synonymous with um, dominance, control, authority, which is the main like patriarchal view of, of, of power. Um, power with is, uh, you could describe as like solidarity, uh, comradeship, coalition, and power too is a kind of uh, manifesting or enabling or something like that. Um, but I knew that I wanted to explore what just power was without any qualifier, like if it just the essence of it. And, and then I also knew that I wanted to see how that could be uh, useful within this prism of sensuous knowledge, which, which is a prism that is political, spiritual, intellectual, um, and psychological at one. Um, so it really, it was, it was a chapter that I, um, that I both enjoyed working on the most, but that also felt most uh, urgent. And therefore, like there was a kind of pressure that I had with that. Um, and so exusions emerged um, from the combination of all of these things as something which was holistic um, and poetic and sort of rooted in uh, in an essence rather than in power to power over and things like that. Um, but that was also uh, something that could help us, I think, tackle politically and socially urgent questions in a way that was evoking beauty and 
and imagination and poetry. Um, because that's another thing, going back to uh, fostering a higher dimension of coexistence, um, it's gonna, we're gonna require beauty in order to do that, uh, which is why my book ends with a chapter about beauty. Um, and yeah, exuberance by sort of tapping into this, once I started to develop the, the concept of branching, which I define as the kind of the grammatic element of exuberance. So it's the, it's the grammar of it. It's how exuberance speaks, uh, how it expresses itself it is in branching. Um, and just, you know, for people that are tuning in, like th the branching is based on uh, dendritic patterns. So dendritic means tree-like. Um, and we, see, we have these patterns obviously in trees, in, in thunder and rivers. And if you were to take an aerial view of mountains, you'd see the dendritic patterns. But then also within our bodies, in our, in our lungs, our capillaries, our nervous system, like when you see MRI images of them, you know, it's exactly the same kind of shape. Um, and that shape and that grammar is speaking to um, something that is becoming, uh, you know, something that is really alive, um, but it isn't alive without a kind of goal. It is, it's, it's almost, you know, when you look at a dendritic pattern, it's as if it's, um, it's, it's, it's so beautiful because it's something that is still, but it also has this quality of rushing somewhere. You know, it's, it's, it's almost, uh, it's almost like an orgasm or something, you know, it's that, that sense of like, that it, you know, like if you were to draw an orgasm, it could be a kind of dendritic pattern because it just has that, that sense of rushing somewhere. Um, and yeah, that's what power is, the essence of power, that, that ability to be, to be still, to be grounded, um, but also to be manifesting and to be becoming. Um, and yeah, so it's, it's, uh, it's a really great concept that, you know, I feel privileged to have, that it kind of came to me um, from wherever it came. And, 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 and because I then was developing exusions for uh, what is emerging, um, you know, I've gotten to sort of know it better since writing my book. And I'm still like, it's a four part series. So there's still more essays to be developed. And uh, the, the clearer exusions has become to me, um, you know, the, the, yeah, it just, um, it's, it, it is really an empowering way of, of, of empowerment. So I'm glad that, uh, that it resonated with you. I'm really happy to hear that. Yeah, it's feels as if your words sort of clicked into something that I was starting to discern in my own life of this of this way of this understanding of power, which is just could be quite simply characterized as becoming more of what you are, uh, becoming more of yourself. Um, but also, I just want to quickly add there in connection with others, because that's such an that's the thing that is missing mm. in patriarchal definitions of power. It's like this sense of community and reciprocity that, yeah, so it's like becoming more of yourself while also enabling or witnessing others and nature becoming more of themselves and itself. It's a, it's a kind yeah. of critical element of existence. And yeah, sort of ultimately seeing that you are constituted of all the people and experiences in your life. And um, yeah, just looking, you know, it's been a process for me as well of beginning to perceive my body as something which is natural and of nature. Um, so really perceiving ourselves and our own sort of mortality and um, deep relationship with the planet and it's so easy to forget when 
everything that you eat comes in a styrofoam package and you don't see the animal or um you know field that it grew in or whatever is the case um but i feel sort of drawing to a close that the beautiful the most beautiful aspect of sensuous knowledge and i think um something that's emerging in a lot of places but particularly with the philosopher john viveki and his sort of dialogos conversations with other people is the importance of dialectic um and this move from dialectic as a shared inquiry towards truth to um a dialogos where it's kind of flowing through like the logos of the conversation seems to become a third entity um which neither of us are in control of and it's just kind of flowing out and in the spirit of dialectic i'm sure this understanding of exuberance is going to continue to um evolve and move and have different flavors and maybe be represented in different ways um so i look look forward to seeing more of that and yeah i'd really love to engage in a in further conversation about this because i've been developing um through sense based but through my own life this a lot of sort of models for understanding um the nature of self and the nature of sort of trauma and uh, using branching patterns in a very similar way sort of considering the self as branching patterns and sort of your experiences as like branches and roots that you're cut off from um and and this kind of mysterious way in which we are drawn to to find people with reciprocal characteristics to our own um and you know the unfortunate reality of people um becoming stuck in relationship patterns and always finding that they end up with the same kind of corresponding trauma to their own and this kind of thing um i think we can begin to to use these branching uh didentric didentric is that right interesting uh, yeah these patterns um to to perceive sort of how those interactions are taking place um non visibly but kind of shaping the course of our lives um mostly drawing on my own uh, experiences of not being conscious of those dynamics and then becoming conscious later on um, so yeah i'd love to to further the conversation but this has been really awesome and it's been a pleasure speaking with you today and if there's any, you know you, you want to add at the end feel free um yeah, yeah no i i hope we get a chance to explore further as well and i think you know what you just touched upon there is is something that exuberance and branching really does indeed help with um and you know cuz that's that's another element of of it is that it is therapeutic in some sense um sensuous knowledge as well is therapeutic in some sense and and in in euro patriarchal knowledge there's such a um yeah like a a, a con condemning of uh bringing together knowledge and therapy of sorts or you know anything that's healing um and and yeah i think that's that's a that's very important for people um living in such complex times um and so yeah i just thought as you were speaking about how uh, you know quite often those kind of repetitive patterns in our lives um you know in in branching they could be kind of symbolized by a, a part of a tree branch getting cut off um or something like that but then also uh you know i sometimes think if if we use a tree as an example uh the trunk and the roots are so stable and that that kind of is our core self our our and i mean self with a capital s so it's a self that's also connected to everybody else um and the branches 
uh, are the many different paths that this core self extends into. Um, and, and we can sometimes become very focused on only one branch. Um, but yeah, it can help us to, to just see that there's a lot of other things um, going on in our lives and a lot of other choices and options that can be taken, uh, journeys that can be embarked on. Um, it's, yeah, it's difficult, but it's definitely a, a symbolism that I think can help with um, ending unhealthy and repetitive patterns. Mm. But yes, thank you um, very much for, for this, this space to share my thoughts. And uh, it's been a real pleasure. I hope we, we get to discuss more. Likewise, Mina. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much for coming on. Thank you.